Hello and welcome to NRB Live at Lunch. I'm Noelle Garnier, your host. Every month at NRB, we do panels with experts um, that we hope will equip and inform our members to advocate on the issues that matter to them. And this panel is no exception. Whether you're a, in Christian media, Christian ministry, issue advocacy, what we're talking about today is for you. Sanctity of life is by no means a new issue, but it's an ever evolving space. The tactics change, the language changes, the impact that this issue has on voters changes, the agency rules and legislation change. Abortion never really leaves the news cycle for long and pro-life education and resources are always needed. Today's special guests have been powerful and effective in driving the pro-life movement forward. Today, we're going to unpack the latest legislative updates, talk about challenges to the movement, and give Christian broadcasters tools to improve their engagement on this issue. I'm so excited to introduce you to our panelists today. So let's begin first with Robin Chambers, who is the Executive Director of Advocacy for Children at Focus on the Family. And Robin has actually been with Focus on the Family for more than 25 years. In fact, Robin, I think you said it's 29 years coming up. Yes, October 16th will be my 29th anniversary here at Focus. That's incredible. What has it been like to be with Focus for all of those years? Well, I, I laugh often and say this was the longest temp assignment I've ever had. So Focus on the Family was moving out from California to Colorado Springs. We've gotten a land grant from a local foundation. And I started as seasonal help thinking I was just going to be answering the phones for Christmas time. Um, and then the Lord had a different uh, call on my life. And I've been in this space, the sanctity space, for almost 20 years my time here at Focus. And, um, you know, what you said, Noelle, is so, so relevant. Discussion about abortion never changes, um, but the tactics certainly have. And that's what Focus on the Family has really tried to keep in touch with for many, many years on just having that conversation. Yes, and very effectively. And I understand that in addition to working on sanctity of life, you also work on issues related to the welfare of children in foster care, as well as overseeing another project called Option Ultrasound, which provides ultrasound machines and sonography training to pro-life medical clinics in um, areas with a high occurrence of abortions. That's all incredible work. Thank you. I Thank you. love every minute. It's a little crazy, but I love every minute. <laughs> Thank you. Next, we have, speaking of veterans in the cause, we have Brad Mattis, who's contributed to the pro-life movement for nearly half a century. He's the president and co-founder of Life Issues Institute, a commentator for its daily program, and an international speaker and lecturer on abortion and euthanasia issues. Brad, thank you for being with us today. Well, thanks for having me. It's a joy to be here with this panel, especially. Thank you. And last but not by any means least, we have Abby Johnson, who joins us today. Um, Abby became an outspoken advocate for pro-life for the pro-life movement after spending eight years rising through the ranks in Planned Parenthood. As a young woman, Abby, as you've told in your story, as a, a young woman who really had a desire to help other women and sincerely believed that Planned Parenthood may be a way to do that. Yes, and I'm so I'm sorry. I'm looking behind me, and I see that my suitcase is out in my hotel room. So I suitcase is welcome. <laughs> you know what? I do, I should have looked behind me before I got on this. Thing. You know what? I'm in, I'm in a hotel room. I'm traveling. I'm sorry, guys. This is live programming. This is live programming. We 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 welcome all uh, all suitcases. Real life. This is real life. You know, real life on the road. <laughs> but just jumping into your story a little bit. Um, You've shared before that your convictions changed in 2009 after being asked to actually assist with an ultrasound abortion, which was a new experience for you at that time. And it led to a change of heart that drew you ultimately away from Planned Parenthood and, and into the pro-life advocacy space. And you shared your whole story in a best-selling book called Unplanned, which then became a blockbuster movie about three years ago. Um, we're so happy to have you with us today. And, and what is it that your organization does now? Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I run in, I run two organizations actually, but the first one that I started, um, and probably the one that most people know about is called, and then there were none. And we are a nonprofit ministry that helps get abortion clinic workers and abortion doctors out of the industry. And we get them into a, a life-saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And, you know, when we, we, you know, always ask 
these men and women, what was it that drew you into wanting to work in the abortion clinic? And the majority of the time, the answer is the same. They will say, and it was the same for me. They will say, you know, I, I wanted to help women and, you know, often we'll ask them, well, what, what was the thing that led you to want to leave? Right. And the answer will often be the same. Well, I wanted to help women, you know, often when we're working there, we, we think that we're helping women. We think that we're doing the best thing for women. And then all of a sudden you realize this is actually not help we're hurting women. Not only are we hurting their children, of course, by, by killing their children through abortion, but we're hurting women and we're not giving them real choices. We're not giving them real options. And we have believed the lie ourselves that abortion is empowerment, that abortion is, you know, helping women that we are giving them real options inside the abortion industry. But because we have believed that lie, then we in turn have sold that lie to thousands of women who come into our facilities. And so in order to really help women in the way that we wanted to, to begin with, we recognize that we have to leave. We have to flee those facilities because we have been participating in something that was truly evil. And as scripture says, when you recognize that you are participating in evil, when you see evil, you must flee from it. And so that's what our organization does. We help people. Once they recognize that evil, we help them flee from it. And to date, we have been able to help 600 abortion clinic industry workers, nurses, um, medical assistance, you name it, across the board, we need, we've we been able to help them leave their jobs and find hope and healing in Jesus Christ. And we've also been able to help seven full-time abortion doctors leave their jobs and find hope and healing in Christ. That's very powerful. Abby, in your experience, and, and we'll, we'll have time later to dig much more into these issues, but in your experience, um, does the decision to leave the abortion industry typically correspond with a conversion to Christianity or are there other reasons as well why people choose to leave? Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, it sometimes does. I will say that the majority of people who work in the abortion industry do have some sort of faith foundation. So, and that surprises a lot of people when I tell them that, but, um, you know, the majority of people in our country have some sort of faith foundation. And so the majority of people working in the industry are no different. Um, these are not people that grew up in atheist homes or, you know, homes. I, I think that's sort of a misconception. Um, when I remember when I first came out and I told people, you know, I grew up in a very conservative pro-life, uh, you know, Southern Baptist home, people were like, what, how, how can that be? Um, but, you know, I often tell people we're all just one sin away from walking into an abortion clinic, whether it's having an abortion yourself, working in the industry, you know, sin takes us down a road at a very slow pace. And so I didn't, you know, go to bed one night and wake up the next morning working in an abortion clinic, right? It was a very slow path into this life of immorality. And any of us, can find us walking down that path. Many of us have found ourselves walking down that path. In fact, the, the pro-life movement is made up of converts to the pro-life movement. We are, we are a movement that is made up of women who have laid on the tables of, a, of abortion uh, facilities. We, we are you know men who have driven their girlfriends, wives, partners to have abortions, people who have paid you know, to, for women in their lives to have abortions. We are a movement of converts. That's why our movement is so powerful. There are, are very few people that you will find uh, saying, you know, well, you know, gosh, I used to, I used to love saving babies, but now I'm for abortion. You know, there's very few people that you can find like that, but there are literally millions of people who will say to you, I used to support abortion, but now I am pro-life. And, and so, you know, that's, and, and that's how God works, right? He often brings us from death to life. And, and that's just how good God is. Um, he, he is a God of redemption and forgiveness and grace, and he will meet us 
where we are. And, and he meets many of our clients where they are. And sometimes that is, you know, in the halls of those abortion clinics. And for me, it was in that room during that abortion procedure. I mean, that was where he really broke my heart for the unborn and said, what you're doing is wrong. The Bible talks about, you know, the veil being lifted and, and sometimes he will lift that veil right in the middle of an abortion procedure or right there in the middle, smack dab in the middle of a hallway of an abortion clinic. And so many of these workers do have some sort of faith foundation. And so part of their conversion is returning them back to that foundation of Christ. Thank you for sharing that. I want to take our first, well, we've already had such an incredible discussion in our, in our introductions, but our, our first official question, um, I would like to kind of give our audience a, a little bit of a 10,000 foot view of, of where the pro-life movement is in your opinion. And I'll, I'll go first to Brad and um, then to Abby and to Robin. Uh, but recently, just, just this week, I was reading and a writer for the Atlantic made sort of a terse acknowledgement that nationwide opponents of abortion rights appear to be winning. Brad, in your opinion, are opponents of abortion winning? Absolutely, Noel. Absolutely. And yes, they can get a little snarky when we're uh, on the upswing, as we've all experienced. But, um, you know, pro-abortion advocates have good reason for the heart, heartburn that they're experiencing right now, because uh, it's becoming increasingly clear that Roe v. Wade is living on borrowed time. I'm sorry, we had a little bit of a network issue there. Thank you, Brad. Um, Abby, can I go to you next? Sure. Um, you know, I think I think Brad's absolutely right. Um, I think that the abortion industry, I think abortion advocates are incredibly concerned right now, as they should be. Um, you know, December 1st is going to be a historic day for the pro-life movement. Uh, you know, that's, of course, when uh, when A.G. Fitch from Mississippi is going to be laying out her case to hopefully overturn Roe in the United States. And this has been a long time coming. I mean, almost 50 years we have been waiting for this opportunity. And um you know, I think she she could possibly be the woman to do it. So we are we are very excited about this opportunity. We see uh, an incredible momentum taking place just in the states. Um, you know, and I'll be honest with you, when when we have an adversary in the White House, we uh, we usually see a uptick in state legislative efforts. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's something to be said about that. Um, you know, pro we're not going to win this battle from the federal administration. We're not going to win this battle in the White House. Now that's not to say that voting isn't important. Of course it is. That's not to say that laws aren't important. Of course they are. Legislation is incredibly important. That's why I do so much work. That's why so many of us do so much work, um, you know, in, in legislation. But we are strongest at our ground game in the pro-life movement. We are strongest at the grassroots level. And so a lot of times, you know, when we had an advocate in the White House, when we had President Trump in the White House, people sort of said, okay, did my job, got our pro-life guy in there. And then they sort of sat back and, and they said, we've, we've done our, we've done our duty, you know, but now that we have an adversary to life in the white house, now we see bigger campaigns, 40 days for life campaigns. We see more and more people praying on the sidewalk. You know, we have an uptick in state legislation. That's not the way it should be. We should have consistent a consistent 
uptick of momentum across the country, no matter who is in the White House. Because abortion does not happen in the White House. It does not happen in the halls of Congress. It happens every single day in our communities in abortion clinics across this country. And so, you know, this should be a wake up call to Christians across this nation that no matter who is in the White House, no matter who is in the majority in our Congress, that we have a responsibility to be out in front of those abortion clinics, to be supporting our pregnancy centers, to be doing whatever we have to do at the ground level, at that grassroots level, because that's how we end abortion. It is sharp analysis. Thank you so much. Robin, what are your thoughts on this issue? Are opponents of abortion winning right now? I think so. And I was just, you know, nodding my head with everything Abby said. And one of the ways that, um, and I know Abby wouldn't ever pat herself on the back, but one of the ways that she, she does such a brilliant job of talking about this grassroots level and their organizations like Abby's the pro lab where they're serving women who are choosing life, women who were abortion determined. There are so many organizations right now in this pro-life movement. Um, a friend of mine, great colleague, Amy Ford, who is the founder of Embrace Grace. She says, you know, pro-life is a stance pro love is the action. And that's what it's taking, you know, and I agree with Abby. Um, this is a hard issue for me. This is not a political issue. I had my own unplanned pregnancy. The reason I chose life was because I had support. So when that young woman is in that unplanned pregnancy, where are the people to coming alongside her to say, congratulations, how can I support you? Um, and there's so many organizations that are doing that. We're not just pro birth. We are pro woman. We are pro love. We are pro baby. Absolutely. But again, Abby is right. It is at the church level. It's the pregnancy centers. That's one of the main reasons that Focus on the Family started Option Ultrasound. That program has been around for 18 years. And we want to make sure that there's um, brand new ultrasound machines, nurses being trained to provide that medical procedure. Um, and that ultrasound is what helps a woman see what's going on in her life, in her, in her womb. She's not buying the lie anymore that this is a clump of tissue when you can see that beautiful little baby on that ultrasound. There's so many things like that that are happening um, that's peeling back the skills, as Abby said. And then we're showing life, we're showing truth every single day. Abortion is not healthcare. Healthcare is serving that young woman and her child when she's in her most vulnerable state. So that's why Focus on the Family partners with groups like Abby Johnson and Brad's group and Embrace Grace and so many others. We are stronger together and we can do this, like Abby said, in our communities every single day. I just did an interview um, and with our local Fox affiliate and she said, well, why are women leaving Texas to get an abortion? And I, I don't feel like there's a need for them to, to leave Texas. There's more than 75 pregnancy centers right in Texas who are ready and willing to serve that young woman. We just need to get the word out there that they're ready. Come on in. We'll serve anyone coming into that center. So Texas is doing an amazing job. Well, Robin, that's a great segue into our next topic. Obviously, SB 8, the uh, Texas Harvey bill is not the only thing going on in the pro-life space, but it is one of the most talked about right now. And on October 6, a U.S. District Court uh, Judge Robert Pittman issued a preliminary injunction to uh, ban the law from being enforced in Texas. But just two days later, it was overturned by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. And what our audience may or may not know is that the law is constructed in such a way that if it is blocked or enjoined by the court, but is later vacated by a higher court, procedures that took place under the injunction while the injunction was in effect um, are, are still liable. Um, but now the injunction has been overturned. So can I turn to Abby first, your reactions and analysis to those developments? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I am a Texan. So uh, this was, uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, I worked quite a bit on the heartbeat bill. You know, this was a different, we, we went about this a different way. Um, it, the heartbeat bill was constructed a different way in the state of Texas um, in order to, you know, hopefully withstand court challenges. And so far it has, we expected Pittman to, he is an activist judge. So we expected him to to rule in the way he did. Um, but, you know, the Fifth Sor Circuit uh, did what they did. So we were, <laughs> we were very excited about that. Um, you know, the heartbeat bill in the state of Texas, we estimate is saving about 130 babies every single day. 
Uh, we recognize that there are some women, uh, you know, a few women who are going out of state to have abortions. And, but that's unnecessary. Uh, it's like Robin said, there are, you know, over a hundred organizations in the state of Texas that stand ready to help women who are in need. And, you know, I think for the first time we, we saw something really interesting. I mean, we saw, you know, Hollywood, of course, we I just wrote an article in response to Billie Eilish you know, a singer, um, you know, we, we had a lot, a lot of sort of Hollywood elites, right? Like coming out actors and actresses and singers coming out and just enraged, right? People enraged that they can't kill their babies in the state of Texas. These aren't even people that live in Texas, right? Um, they act as if you would think, the way that, that the media talks about this, you would think that every single woman in Texas is walking around pregnant looking for an abortion, okay? But, um, but you know, I was thinking about it and I've sort of talked about this a little bit, but this is the first time really in, in almost 50 years that young women, women of, you know, childbearing age are actually having to think about the consequences of their sexual activity. So they are for the first time having to bear the consequences of that activity. And, and that is a, that's something that I think for a lot of these women is blowing their minds, right? And so they're coming out in anger because the society that we live in has promoted consequence-free sexual activity for so many years. That was a product of the sexual revolution. And that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother panel discussion. But anyway, but that's what, that's what our society has promoted for so long. And now for the first time, these women are, they're actually having to think, oh my gosh, there are consequences to my actions. And that's something that these young women have not thought about their whole entire lives. Uh, there's always been a quick fix, a quick solution to their problem. And, and our society has told them that abortion has no consequences. It has, you, you have no regrets, right? You give us $400, we, we give you the, the solution to this problem and you'll never have to think about it again. Now we know that that's a lie. But that's, that's the lie that society has sold to them. And so they're reeling from this. And, and this is really a paradigm shift in our society. And paradigm shifts are difficult for people to embrace many times. But I think that, I think that this is an important step, especially for young people. This is an important step for them to understand that our actions often do have consequences. And I remember in Texas a few years ago when uh, we changed from parental notification for abortion to parental consent. And it was the same, the abortion lobby freaked out, right? But what happened in the state of Texas was not just that minor abortions went down in the state of Texas, but teen pregnancies also went down in the state of Texas. Because these young people for the first time were thinking, wait a minute, I don't have an easy way out if I do get pregnant. So I need to reel in my behavior. And so it was, a, once again, a paradigm shift in the state. And that's what I think is starting to happen in our country. But it will happen. They will go down swinging, right? And so that's what we're seeing now. But it's, it's a godly change that I believe that we're seeing in our country. That's very interesting. Interesting to frame that as potentially um, not just a you know a public shift toward Christian values because obviously that that comes from from a relationship with God, but but a shift toward at the very least personal responsibility, adult responsibility. That's an interesting aspect of the conversation that that isn't always considered. Um, Brad, can I go to you? Do you have any insights on the impact of the Texas heartbeat bill? Sure. Um, yeah, well, as Abby said. Um, the, um, the Judge Pittman 
his, he was, he's an activist judge and his ruling, if you've read it, uh, reads like Planned Parenthood wrote it. So, you know, expecting that, that ruling wasn't a big surprise. Now we were talking to state, uh, Texas State Senator Brian Hughes last week before the appellate court ruled, and he expected the appellate court to do just what it did. No surprises there. And then he added um, that if, um, if before the appellate court ruled, if the Texas abortionists performed abortions contrary to the Heartbeat Act, that they would be, uh, could be held liable and prosecuted. So he didn't think that the uh, abortionists were actually performing abortions during that window of time. And, um, you know, I don't know if this is um, a strategy by the Supreme Court or not, we'll never know. But, you know, as, as you alluded to, Abby, the other side is channeling Chicken Little and saying the sky is falling. And we're going to see, uh, I think we all predict that we'll see that the sky actually stays up in the heavens where it belongs. And um, I wonder if the Supreme Court kind of used this almost a year time for us to get used to the idea that Roe v. Wade may be overturned. And uh, so a lot of us are expecting that with the, the Mississippi case, we'll actually see Roe v. Wade overturned by God's grace. And uh, there's so much going on behind the scenes, I think, that we don't know. Uh, but here, this was an attempt, a feeble attempt by an activist judge. And um, I think his ruling was poorly contrived. Uh, Robin, do you have any additional insights on this? You know, obviously focus on the family would support um, any efforts that are put in place at any of the state levels that are protecting women and their children. But interesting, you know, to hear Abby talk about, you know, that personal responsibility, um, you know, our sexual responsibility. Um, that just happened. It focused that conversation. And so just, it's just amazing to me to see how God kind of like-mindedness. Um, and our parenting team is actually creating an entire curriculum that is called Biblical, Biblical Sexual Intelligence, but it's very science-based. And it's talking about sexual risk avoidance, you know, and, and, and what we used to call abstinence. And now you're not allowed to say abstinence in school. Um, but it really is talking about sexual intelligence. And I think, Abby, you're spot on um, in really wanting to get that information out to our young people that they can make those right decisions. And, you know, I, I really get tired of the kind of the rhetoric of women aren't strong enough, we're not smart enough, or we're not brave enough to make these decisions. I think we're selling our young women short. I think they have that intelligence. We just need to empower them with education in order to really make those better decisions. So I think we're on the right track um, in really holding people accountable, really holding them accountable to decisions. And we all know that the best decision is life, but it starts way back before she's in that situation. Um, and I think that's where the education comes in. And I, I don't understand the kind of the pushback from the pro-abortion side of not wanting women to have education. Why? Why are we not educating women? Why is that not the goal to empower that young woman to make those better decisions? So I agree 100% with Abby that, you know, it goes way back to those sexual decisions before she gets in a situation where it's now I, I now I'm in a in a panic state and I have to make a decision I could regret the rest of my life so I agree I think Texas is on the right track um, I, you know Colorado just had our, our last election we had prop 115 on our ballot that talked about greater restriction for abortion here in Colorado um, and unfortunately it was, it was defeated but I looked at just the number of votes. There was over 1.2 million people who voted for greater restrictions. I think people want to see um, that responsibility, that personal responsibility come back into um, those decisions. Um, I, I, again, I look at that, I look at the votes and think there are people who are coming more and more into that pro-life space because there's um, a desire for better education, better um, decision making abilities. And so, again, I just, I applaud um, the Texas decision in any other state that would follow in really supporting those pro-life efforts. The points you've been making about the change in language are so, so well taken, and that's so significant. And we're going to come back to that issue uh, just momentarily. 
But Robin, I want to go right back to you with another policy question. Uh, the Biden administration recently revoked and replaced the Trump administration's 2019 Title X rule that prevented recipients of Title X funds from promoting abortion as a form of family planning, and it also required them uh, to keep abortion services separate from non-abortion services. What type of impact do these measures have on the actual occurrence of abortions in this country? I'm sorry, I am, I am losing, I can barely hear you. Can you, let me, I'm so sorry, it's going in and out, Noelle, I can barely hear you. Can you jump to Abby and let me see if I can mute and come back in, I apologize. For sure, Abby, did you catch that question? Sorry, yes. Um, so yeah, that was, you know, it was sort of expected uh, that that Biden would would overturn um, what what Trump had done with title title 10 funding. Um, so, uh, you know, sort of let me explain title 10 a little bit. Title 10 is a cash grant program that is uh, basically it's something that that clinics can, they can apply for. So they can go to the, uh, you know, they can, they can submit an application and they can submit an application for so much money every year. And then it's, it's so much money is allocated to this facility. And then once they run out of that money, they're out of that money for the year. And September 1st, every year, more money comes into their account. Okay. So it's unlike Medicaid, like a traditional title 19 program that is just an unlimited slush fund. Okay. For money title, title 10, title 20, title five, those are cash grants. There's just a certain amount of money you can get. Um, title 10 is one of the largest uh, amount pools of cash grant money that that Planned Parenthood receives every year. Um, Title 10 and Title 20. Those are the two largest pools of, of cash grant money that they receive. And so it was pretty significant that uh, that President Trump pulled that from them. Planned Parenthood was receiving about $60 million from Title 10 every year. And so it was, a, you know, a, a pretty, pretty big chunk of money. I mean, for Planned Parenthood, it's sort of small change, but as far as title title cash grants go, it was it was a pretty good chunk. So, um, and it was just yet another another piece of the pie that was taken away from Planned Parenthood. So so in that sense, it was significant. Um, and so of course we expected Biden to then refund Planned Parenthood and abortion providers of that Title X money, and that's what he's done. Title 10 generally at Planned Parenthood is used for their teen clinics. So this is money that they use to operate their teen healthcare facilities. So Title 10 money allows teenagers to come in and get healthcare services, birth control, abortifacient birth control, you know, IUDs, whatever it may be. Um, without parental knowledge or consent. So this is an opportunity for Planned Parenthood to uh, possibly operate healthcare centers inside of your children's school, to get your kids on birth control without you knowing. And it's not really about the birth control. And that's what people need to understand. That's what parents need to understand. They operate teen clinics so that they can develop a relationship with your child, with your grandchild to, to create a barrier between you and your child so that they can destroy any sort of relationship that you have with your child. That's the intention. So the intention is they develop a relationship so that your child won't go to you 
when they start having questions about sexuality or relationships or whatever, that they are the go-to in your children's life. They get them hooked on a birth control pill or a birth control method very, very early on in their adolescence. They get them to trust that birth control method, even though they know that 54% of women having abortions were using contraception at the time that they got pregnant. So they get them hooked on this birth control method that they know has a high human error rate. And so it's just a business model for them. And it's a business model that creates ongoing patients in their abortion clinics. So people, I often talk about this and people say, oh, Abby, that just sounds like a conspiracy theory, but it's not a conspiracy theory. This is their model. Their whole goal is to have a woman, a young woman back into their clinics at least three times by the time they're 25 or 26 years old. Wow. So, I mean, this, and it's working. It's working because abortion is now seen in our society as a birth control method. Gone are the days where we used to, where we used to say, you know, abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. Abortion is a birth control method for many, I would say the majority of young women in our society. Wow. So what you're telling us is really that those Title X funds are, are what, are, what are primarily used by Planned Parenthood to cultivate young girls as clientele for the product they are selling, which is abortions. Yes. Incredible. Uh, that's, that's, um, that's so heavy. That's so dark. Um, it, it's incredible to think that, that it would be possible that, you know, your, your child could be going off to school and developing a relationship with Planned Parenthood, really, that, that you don't know anything about, you know, curtailing the parents' involvement in, the, in their child's life in that respect. Well, that's why Planned Parenthood is so adamant about getting into the public school system starting in kindergarten. Their sex education program begins in kindergarten. And, you know, it's not because they want to teach your kids about sex. It's because they want to cultivate that relationship with your child. And they often say parent, parents are a barrier to service. That's what they say. So, you know, I used to go into schools. I mean, I used to educate kids and we would say, if you have a question, don't go to your parents. Your parents will not understand what you're going through. You come to me. You've known me. You've known me for the past six years. You know you can come to me. There's no judgment here. Don't go to your parents. That's what these educators are saying. I know. I used to say it. This is what these educators are saying. That's why they're going into your kid's school at starting in kindergarten to build up those relationships, to build up those trust relationships. They are trying to separate children from their parents. I'm blown away by what you just said. Parents are a barrier to service. Parent, parents are a barrier to service. That's, un, that's unbelievable. That's completely I mean, unbelievable. People, don't, people don't understand. They don't believe that Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry is as sinister as they are. But guys, they're killing babies. That's their highest revenue generating product. Of course they are that sinister. Look at what they do. <laughs> I mean, this is how they make the majority of their money. Of course, they're that sinister. Of course they are. I mean, child sacrifice is, that's, that's the name of their game. They're willing to do anything to, to gain clients. Well, thank you for making us aware. That is, um, that, you know, many people can appreciate um, what a what a difficult and challenging issue this is, but I think a lot of people are just learning some of those facts for the first time about how deeply, deeply anti-family, and not just not just in terms of anti-child, but anti-family, anti-parents, um, anti-links between generations. You know, all of those things are part of the philosophy of Planned Parenthood, and and um, that's a really in-depth topic that we could that we could talk about all day. Um, but thank you for sharing those insights. 
Um, I want to go to another issue that that se several pro-life organizations have 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 um, described: um, the issue of deplatforming. Several pro-life groups have had their, especially through Google Ads, YouTube Ads, um, have had their advertising campaigns. Um, denied or or just outright um, wholesale or in, in specific regional markets or they've seen decreased reach things like that. Um, this is an open question to all three of you. Uh, have have any of your organizations experienced deplatforming in any way? I can jump in real quick, and I apologize. I was getting major interference, so Abby, I missed a lot of what you said. So I I'm sure you nailed it. Um, for Focus on the Family, what we launched about two years ago was a digital directory of pregnancy centers who have received a grant from Focus called the My Choice Network. Um, and we actually have been able to navigate through, um, I always say the shark infested censorship waters, um, because we don't do a lot of uh, Google AdWords, we kind of play in a different sandbox, um, but we've seen one of the organizations we've partnered with for years, Heartbeat International, um, they had an entire campaign that was shut down because they were talking about abortion pill reversal, and for whatever reason, that seems to be very controversial that you're trying to um, reverse the abortion pill. Um, so we are just keeping track of that. We have an outside vendor who literally um, just kind of watches what's going on in that world and and can really navigate through that for us. Um, it's what we say, it's how we say it, it's where you said the different platforms. Um, and we try as much as we can to avoid Google when those wars are going on. So we've been okay for now. Okay, very, very interesting to hear. It sounds like Focus is navigating that in a very smart way. And, and there are probably ways to, to protect and defend yourself against that type of censorship, which is very much going on. Right. Um, I would like to turn to Brad Mattis again. Um, your organization has focused on a, a in a very on a very specific um, aspect of the pro life argument, and that's the that's the topic of post abortive parenthood. Um, your ministry has emphasized the need to acknowledge and and support, in your words, fathers who have lost a child to abortion, which you call forgotten fathers who secretly grieve their lost fatherhood. Why are you focused on this particular group? Well, primarily because they are forgotten. Uh, they're left out of the equation entirely when it comes to abortion. Uh, laws on the books give uh, the father no legal recourse over the decision whether his baby lives or dies. Uh, many people ask me if I've personally experienced um, a loss by abortion, and I haven't. But in 1995, I received a handwritten letter and it changed my life. Um, it was from a man who wrote about his younger brother who was living with a girl and over that course she had two abortions. After the second one, he broke up with her, moved out of the apartment, moved in with his mother in his room in the basement, hardly spoke to anyone. Well, those are huge red flags. And one day when his mother went to the garage to go to work, she found her son hanging by the rafters in the garage. And she called the older brother who wrote the letter because he was close by. And when he got there, he found his mother desperately trying to hold up her son so that the noose wouldn't be tied around his neck and that somehow he would be, could be revived. And from that moment on, um, I decided the Holy Spirit put this on my heart that we need to stand in the gap between men and abortion and the, the consequences of them. Um, we have seen everything from suicide to murder suicide to deep depression. The research that has been done shows about 8% of men are severely wounded, walking wounded as I call them. And that's about 5 million men that we have. And so I and about 12 others formed the Men in Abortion Network or MAN as we call it. Um, we're experts in the field of men in abortion. And we developed a website called meninabortion.net. And on that website, men can ask for a free mentor counselor, regardless of where they live. When a request comes in, we prioritize that and we get them the counselor they need. One guy wrote from Fairbanks, Alaska, that he was thinking of, of driving to the abortion facility and blowing out his brains. So we we immediately got him the help he need. 
needed. He got into a church. He's now, he had no religious background. He's now a believer and he's been healed. And um, we've seen a lot of miracles as a result of the Holy Spirit. But we provide resources. We want to reach out to men and let them know you're not alone and that there's hope and healing after abortion and we'll walk you through it. And the best way to do that is through scripture. Scripture is fertile ground for helping men heal after abortion. And when you walk a man through that process, no, I'll tell you, it is such an exhilarating and humbling experience because before your eyes, you see this man change and not from what we're doing, but really what the Holy Spirit's doing. And, and it's, it's just a, a, a privilege to be part of that. So we want people to understand that there's another victim here in the, the abortion. We talk a lot about the baby, of course, and the mother, absolutely. But we have to talk more about the man. God created us male brains with a desire to provide and protect. And when an abortion takes place, that's counter to all of that. And that's when we see the symptoms develop. If they're not dealt with, then those symptoms compound and get worse and worse. And unfortunately, a lot of men, their lives are falling down around them. But they don't know that abortion may be the root cause. So that's, that's what we do. And there's some urgency to the work. And, um, but it's also a real joy to work with those, those guys in that field. That's very powerful. And, and um, at the end of this session, we're going to have an opportunity to, to share resources. And I hope that at that point, you'll uh, kind of tell our audience where they can go to read more about that and, and take advantage of those resources. I would like to turn back to Abby with a sort of a, a tactical question. Over the years, the language used by the pro-abortion movement has shifted a lot from emphasizing privacy to then emphasizing choice to most recently emphasizing access to health care. Why is this? Abby, can you unmute? Yeah, sorry. Um, you know, I think there's, I think that they have to change the language um, because, I mean, I think that science is obviously not on their side, right? So, as we've learned more and more about the preborn human being, um, as we've learned, you know, more and more about what takes place inside of the womb before a baby is born, um, they're losing, right? So, um, you know, I mean, my, you know, my 14 year old and her friends are, they think abortion is just the worst, right? Because I mean, they're like, are you kidding me? Like a baby can suck its thumb as early as like eight weeks. I mean, like they're, I mean, they're in their mind. They're just like, how could that, how could that be? How could, because they know so much, right? About fetal development. Most people who are, you know, of childbearing age, the first picture of themselves was of them on an ultrasound, right? So they're losing the battle on on the scientific front they're losing the battle on the medical technology front we've got babies now that are born at 21 weeks that are are surviving outside of the womb right so they're they're losing on so many different fronts logically it's not making sense of course you know faith has always come down on the side of life so you know, I think that now they are having to change their language. Um, they're having to change the way they talk about abortion. Even at the, the women's march that they had October 2nd in protest to the heartbeat bill, they put out a, um, they put out a, a flyer or I mean flyer, it was online, but um, it said it had a, a, they did not want people to bring coat hangers, you know, a coat hanger that used to be the sign, right. Of, of the, the 
you know, pro-choice marches, bring a coat hanger, right? We don't want to go back to the coat hanger age, right? They don't even want you to bring coat hangers anymore because they want to normalize at-home abortions with medication abortion. So they don't want to, they don't want people to think that self-managed abortion at home is something that's not normal. So their language, their talking points, it's having to change so much when we have the same message, right? Our message has been the same since the beginning of the pro-life movement, right? That abortion is wrong, that abortion is taking the life of an unborn human being, that abortion is, you know, stopping, it, it, that abortion is murder. I mean, our, our, our language has been the same. Our talking points have been the same. And our talking points for healing have been the same. That God is merciful, that God is, that God redeems all sin, right? That God is a God of conversion, that God is a God of mercy. Our story has never changed that life begins at conception, that's always been our story. It's them that has to continue to modify their story because they don't have truth on their side. We're the ones that have truth on our side. And when yeah. you don't have truth on your side, it's hard to keep up with your lie. Right. And that's what they're having to do. They're constantly having to change the story because it's hard to keep up with their lie. And that's what we're seeing over and over again. So they're having to flip the script. Now, all of a sudden, you know, we went from safe, legal, and rare to, you know, abortion at any cost, abortion access, right? Access at any cost. And it's just healthcare. Abortion's just a, it's just a procedure. It's just a nothing. It's just part of healthcare. And, you know, well, it's, it's healthcare and it's a nothing, but yet it's also a very difficult decision. Well, why is it a difficult decision if it's just healthcare, if it's just a nothing? If it's not a baby, if it's not, if it's not a human being, then why is it a difficult decision? If it's just like having a mole removed off your back, then why is it difficult, right? So they can't, they can't keep up with what they believe. And, and that's like Brad said, it's, things are crumbling around them. And it's, it's becoming very difficult for them. That's very insightful. Just in our last few minutes before we get to our parting thoughts, I would love to dig in a little bit. Our audience is not just talk. They are about action, 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 and we want to equip them. Um, so I would like to give each of you the opportunity to weigh in. What can Christian communicators do to more effectively engage on this issue? And what resources do you recommend? If we can go first to Brad, then Robin, then Abby. Okay. Well, um, we have four different websites. Uh, the one, our main website is lifeissues.org, where we have 5,000 pages of user-friendly information from fertilization to uh, euthanasia and everything in between. We're on uh, the, the regular spots on social media, both myself personally and Life Issues Institute, so you can look for us there. And... Um, as far as the radio stations, uh, I do a daily radio commentary called Life Issues, and we're on over 1,270 outlets uh, currently. Robin, are you, are you ready to weigh in on this? Yes, assuming that I don't get cut off again. I'm again, so sorry. Um, one of the things that we've been very deliberate about doing is being in the social space, because a lot of our um, Kind of that target client, that young woman who's being faced with these decisions. Um, she lives on her phone. And so we have a Facebook page called I Am Pro Life. It is not overtly Christian. It's not judgmental. It's, you know, it's again, the tone and the message is right in line with what Abby was saying with, you know, the redemptive side of this is always something that we talk about. Um, so engage in that way. The social space is a great way for um, conversations to happen. They don't have to be angry don't have to be vitriolic. Um, and then on our main page, focusonthefamily.com, there's a pro-life page and there's um, years and years and years of broadcasts, videos, video series, um, 
books that we feel like are just really solid and helping to equip kind of that everyday person and how to have that conversation about what it means to be pro-life, what it means to be pro-choice. We do talk about pro-choice and um, there's an article that was recently um, posted on that. And it came from a trend that we saw on um, kind of just in social media, what did it mean to be pro-choice? What did it mean to be pro-life? And the only one answering that was Planned Parenthood. And we're like, nope, no, there's got to be another side to the story. So lots of those conversations are on that, fa- that focus on the family page. And it's just a great way to um, educate yourself, educate your kiddos on how to have this conversation and have those 14-year-olds like Abby's that says, you know, this is a, this is a baby human. This is a little person. Um, and so starting that conversation really early with your kids is really key to equipping the next generation to be pro-life. So again, focus on the family.com. Um, but then I am pro-life is a great way just to have, um, conversations that don't need to be, um, aggressive in tone, but we don't back down from the truth and we don't compromise from that truth either. Abby, your thoughts on Christian communicators and any additional resources you'd like to recommend? Well, Brad, I want you to finish what you were saying about station station managers. Finish what you were saying. Oh, you're on mute. Well, we encourage station managers to reach out and ask for interviews. So like Abby is always available for interviews. I am too. As situations come up and uh, important things happen, reach out and we'll, we'll be there to talk to you on air about those things. Uh, one of the things that I really wish every uh, station would do is get involved with your local crisis pregnancy center. That is where the rubber meets the road and you can do so much good uh, partnering with these, these uh, centers who are really out there saving lives. So. Uh, I know the heart of of all of our Christian communicators because I've worked with you for uh, 30 years, literally. And um, the 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 body of work that you've done is has been just awe inspiring. So I would encourage you to look for every opportunity to keep the life issues before your listeners and viewers. Thank you, Brad. Thanks, Abby. Yeah. Um, I I mean I you know I would say the same. I mean, look, you have you have the, the ear of people that need to hear this message. And, you know, there have been, I mean, we have, we, I I can give you just stories. We have workers who, um, former abortion workers who were, who ended up contacting us because they, uh, heard about us on, you know, Janet partial, or they heard about us on, you know, different, different radio shows. Um, or we have, we have some who were literally listening to, uh, we have two workers actually who were listening to James Dobson and, uh, every day in their car, because it's like the only station that would come in. And they just started listening to it on their commute. And that's how they came to Christ. And they came to Christ while they were in their car. And then they were like, I got to get out of the abortion clinic. And so then they reached out to us, you know, so we had one, we had one, one woman who was actually working in the clinic. She's working in a clinic in Kansas. And the only, she had a radio in her office, in her abortion clinic, in the office where she worked. And, uh, the only radio station she could get was a station that had, that had a uh, Dr. Dobson and she listened to him every single day. And she was like, she was like, oh my gosh, I, I got to get out of here. And, and so she was convicted because of Dr. Dobson and that's why she left the clinic. And then she ended up reaching out to us and rededicated her life to Christ. And so, I mean, like Christian, Christian radio, I mean, like Christian film, all of this. I mean, I can tell you just even Christian film. I mean, my movie, and it doesn't, it's not about me. I mean, it has nothing to do with me. I mean, this is about God. This is about what he did through that film. This is about the Holy Mm -hmm. spirit. There have been so many people that have been brought to Christ. There have been so many people who have been brought, you know, to healing from past abortion, men and women and uh, lives that have been saved. God does amazing things 
through the work that you guys are doing. And he uses all different types of mediums and he's using the work that you guys are doing. And don't ever worry about like, am I talking about this too much? Am I offending my audience? You know what? If God puts it on your heart to talk about these issues, then that's the issue that you need to talk about. There's somebody who needs to hear what you're saying at that moment. I believe that wholeheartedly. And, and you're speaking God's truth with a capital T and, and, you know, nothing that we speak, the the truth that we proclaim that's in Christ's name, none of that is returned void. And, and so just continue to do what you're doing and do it with courage. Thank you, Abby. We are in overtime, but I want to give each of you uh, just a parting thought. Um, Robin, can you go to you first and then to Brad and then to Abby? Yes. Um, no, Noelle, can you repeat the question? Again, I'm getting really spotty service. I'm so sorry. Just the chance to give a closing thought. Oh, closing thought. I agree 100% with my colleagues getting involved. That is key. Um, those men and women on the front lines at pregnancy centers across the United States, they deserve our support, whether that's financial, whether it's praying for them, whether it's walking in their walk for life or their banquet or all of the above. Um, getting involved and not sitting on the sideline is the key to really changing hearts and minds um, and speaking out. You know, I, Abby, again, truth um, we have the truth on our side. We can't back down from that, but the key is getting involved. Um, that's the best way to change hearts and minds. Thank you. Brad? Well, we're enticingly close to reversing Roe v. Wade, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program. And um, prayer is a tool for the babies worth more than gold. And so we, we need you to be in prayer. Uh, abortion is one of Satan's most powerful tools to drag souls to hell. And he's not going down without a fight. So we have our participants in a program called On Our Knees, 30 Days in Prayer for Life. And if you go to our website at lifeissues.org, you'll find a way to, to join that effort. You can download a free uh, prayer guide. You can promote it on your stations. It's a wonderful program. It's not branded to any one organization. So we're all climbing aboard and encouraging prayer. And every Monday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time, you can spend 15 minutes with us in prayer. It's such a sweet, wonderful time to pray. Abby, last word to you. Um, you know what? I, I actually, I want to encourage people. Everything that they've said is amazing. And I just want to encourage people to go out, do something uncomfortable and go out to the abortion, your local abortion clinic and pray. And I want to encourage you to, uh, go out and pray for 30 minutes to an hour. God calls us to, to step out of our comfort zone. And if you've never done it before, it will be one of the most uncomfortable things you've ever done in your life. And it is also one of the most powerful things that you can do for the lives of, of women and their preborn children. Uh, the last Planned Parenthood conference I went to, I went into a breakout session and they told us that when there are people praying outside of abortion facilities, their no-show rates for their abortion appointments go up as high as 75%. So just you standing out on the sidewalk could save a life. And it is so important that we go there, that we are that last line of hope to a woman who's walking in for her abortion appointment and to be out there to show her the love and the mercy of Jesus Christ is so important. And so I would encourage everyone who's, who's listening, everyone who's watching to go and do that strange, uncomfortable thing that maybe you've never done before, but to do it for the Lord. And I, I, your life will be changed. Um, the, the first time I ever went out to the clinic, my life was changed and I believe yours will be also. Thank you, Abby. This has been such an informative and action-oriented conversation, and I hope it's added tremendous value to our audience. I want to thank our panelists. Uh, we so appreciate your contributions. You are true pros, true experts, and you've given us just invaluable insights today. I want to thank our audience for joining us and for staying with us, and thank you also to producer Marissa in Nashville for facilitating our live stream. This has been NRB Live at Lunch. I'm your host, Noelle Garnier, and we hope to see you next time. Have a good one.